Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Crystal Economics Center for Integrated Science Learning. My name is Irene Porro. I am a, a director of Crystal McCullough Center, and I'm really delighted to welcome, welcome you all here in person, but also welcome all those who are actually following us via live streaming. Um, we hope that this is, this is part of a little bit of a test. We may give you the introduction that also the live streaming is working okay. So, a couple of things. First of all, uh, we are here tonight really to get ready for the launch of this great space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. In case you needed some help, I think the video showed to you exactly why this mission is so important and so it's going to be so revolutionary. But I also wanted to take a moment to let you know that the person who created that excellent, really beautiful video is the person right here, Mary McDonald, who is our McDonald <laughs> Center Commentary Manager. Um, and really produce this great video that is going to lead us actually for the rest uh, of the two, this coming two weeks as we celebrate Massachusetts STEM Week here at McCullough Center. We are part of many organizations that celebrate Massachusetts STEM Week. And we were proposing this to about 400 middle school students who will come and visit the center this past, in this coming two weeks and will be introduced to the mission through that video. Not only that, the reason why we are doing this event tonight, it's because we, uh, the Macaulay Center, is one of more than 500 sites across the country that NASA has selected to be official um, web community event sites. So again, we are among the first who are going to celebrate uh, or start celebrating the launch of web, but we will continue our center for sure for the next several months. And we hope that we will have updates regularly, maybe even from our guest speaker tonight, as a web uh, telescope will be going for commissioning and then first light and first discoveries that we know that are going to come. So um, I thought it was extremely fitting that the speaker for tonight uh, is Kathy Flanagan. And I'm actually going to read a couple of notes I have about her. Because her, her bio would be much longer, I'd shorten it. <laughs> but Dr. Kathy Flanagan holds an astronomer emerit appointment at the Space Telescope, Space Telescope Science Institute, where she has served as a James Webb Space Telescope Mission Head, Deputy Director, and Interim Director. In her early career, she earned her PhD in physics at MIT where she began working in the field of X-ray astronomy with special interest in developing new instruments for space. She became part of the research staff at Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory at MIT, and she has worked on multiple flight instruments. She has participated in NASA's advisory structure, co-chairing strategic planning documents, and serving on advisory committees. She was recently honored by election as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She has been active in education, beginning with service as a Peace Corps volunteer, teaching math and physics in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And she is a strong advocate for science outreach to the public and the next generation. And on that note, I really would like to mention the fact, and I'm getting emotional, that Kathy was the person that gave me my first job in the field of science outreach. I was a space scientist, passionate about outreach, but she's the person who gave me the first opportunity. And you know, it's one of those, that job was one of those events that changed the trajectory. I don't want to say change my life, but change the trajectory of my career and my life too and help me be the person I am today. So for that, I'm really grateful. And on that note, I invite our guest speaker, Kathy Flanagan. Thank you, Irena. Does anyone mind if I remove my mask while I speak? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I want to uh, acknowledge my dear friend and colleague of more than two decades now um, for that great introduction. Thank you very much, and I'm honored and pleased to be the person that can start off STEM week, I guess. Yeah. Um, what you see in front of you in this slide is a picture, a Hubble picture of the Vail Nebula. The Vail is the lovely filamentary remnant of a supernova or an exploding star that went off 8,000 years ago. 8,000 years ago was a great millennium, I gotta say. <laughs> Not only did they get a supernova, they developed proto writing, they started to domesticate the cat, and they grew barley, from which we get barley soup and maybe beer. So it was a good time, but it's not the end of the great times, because this is a pretty awesome century, quite frankly. And I have to say, a mere five years ago, we had a first detection of a gravitational wave, and here in two short months, we're gonna get the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. A very audacious experiment, definitely designed to do some striking stuff. We will figure out ourselves here today how to design it with our little back of the envelope approximation. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look and see what this mission is actually all about. All right, James Webb is actually an international collaboration among three great space agencies the NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. It is, in fact, to my mind, a world treasure. Uh, all astronomers across the world are really anticipating this, but the public will be as well. It will become the People's Telescope, I hope, and we'll talk about that, just as Hubble has been. NASA, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, is the managing entity, and they actually managed our work as well. My institution is the Space Telescope Science Institute, and it is the Science and Operations Mission Operations Center for this mission. We're located in Baltimore, and Goddard Space Flight Center is right down the street in Greenbelt, Maryland. Northrop Grumman is our biggest and prime contracting industrial partner in the United States, and there are, of course, other partners throughout the world. This is a very complex endeavor. I would like to describe the most obvious features that you've already seen. First of all, it's deployable, which means it's not going to be launched completely rigid as such. It's going to have to open and unfold in space. And as you will see, the reason for that is because it is so large. Six and a half meter segmented adjustable mirror, 18 hexagonal segments. Okay and it's going to be launched on an ESA Ariane 5 rocket because we need a big rocket. It will be launched to L2, we'll see why, that's called the second Lagrange point. That's a point in space approximately a million miles away. Three times farther than the moon. The temperature is going to be maintained about 40 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. So we're talking a very inhospitable environment in some respects. I might not want to launch or you know, hitch a ride on that one, but very good for the science we're about to do. In fact, we'll discover why we want that telescope exactly at that point. All right, there are four science instruments on this to mention. The first is the near-infrared camera. It's uh, devised, uh, developed by the University of Arizona and Lockheed Martin. The near-infrared spectrograph, spectrograph called NearSpec, which is ESA and Airbus as an industrial partner. The mid-infrared in instrument, MIRI, a little bit longer wavelength, must be colder, a little bit more challenging in certain regards, from the European Consortium and Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And the near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, NEARIS, Canadian Space Agency and ComDev. All right, now there are four basic science themes that drove the design of James Webb. The top two are first light and assembly of galaxies are both related to um, infrared to be used for redshift. 
So that's a feature that enters. Redshift is a feature that enters into both of these. The second two, star formation and protoplanetary systems and exoplanet characterization, those actually involve dusty environments. Infrared is needed to peer through the dusty environment. So we see that infrared is going to be useful in both of them. But I want to step back just for a second because we're going to design this machine to do a job. Let's think about it. First light, upper left-hand corner there. First light is an attempt to see the first galaxies that formed in the universe as they formed. Right after the Big Bang. That's what we mean by first light. All right, that's starting really early. Exoplanet characterization, bottom right. That's planets around other stars than our sun. Planets that might be in a habitable zone. Planets that might someday or now have life. We don't know. But it's an interesting question and everything is captured in between. We're actually going from the Big Bang to life with one mission. In fact, as I was thinking about this, I thought about the theme to the Big Bang Theory, right? It all started with a hot, dense, I forget, plasma. <laughs> a hot, dense soup, basically. And it all brought us civilization. We built the pyramids. And it all started with the Big Bang. All right, a two-minute song that takes us from the Big Bang to life. Let's start there. We have a lot of information in there. Let's go ahead and see how we're going to design this on the back of our envelope right here, right now. First slide. Let's choose our science goal, and this is called science systems engineering. Let's choose a science question we want to answer and then figure out what we have to build in order to achieve it. I want to see the first galaxy. That's my science goal. We're going to do this together. Okay. What do I know? I'm not much of an astronomer, I'll tell you the truth, but what do we know about galaxies? Well, I, I think I know that they shine invisible light. And the reason I think so is if you go into the backyard and you're in Maine, someplace that doesn't have all this background light, you sort of see a smudgy area. And I remember the first time I saw it, I thought it was pollution. I didn't know it was, I was looking at the plane of the galaxy. Okay, our own galaxy. So it turns out that galaxies, actually, if you look at that Hubble deep field image and everything else, they shine invisible light. Our eyes can see them. Visible light, okay. Our eyes see visible light, okay. That's the first thing I know. I need to be able to see them. Okay, second thing. I want to see the first galaxies. And the first galaxies, well, I have to be looking at galaxies a long time ago if I want to see them when they first were born, right after the Big Bang. How long ago is the Big Bang? Look at the Big Bang Theory theme song, and they tell me it's 13.7 billion years, so I'm going to look back 13 billion years. All right, two pieces of information, our eyes and the theme song. Okay, <laughs> good. We didn't even need Wikipedia yet. All right. So I need to look 13 billion years, and I actually know from Mary's excellent presentation that because of the expansion of the universe, <clears throat> 13 billion years is actually far away. It's not just long ago, it's really far away. And she said something that I have to recall. Let's think about it. Electromagnetic spectrum. The visible light area is the light our eyes can see. And that's all we can see. Snakes are lucky. Snakes can see infrared. And why is that? Because they like to see nice warm mice in the desert. And warm mice radiate infrared. Okay, useful. All right. And so I seem to recall Mary saying that when the universe expands, visible light gets shifted, gets red shifted towards the red end. In fact, it gets, oops, sorry. It gets red shifted from the visible all the way into the infrared. If I want to see a galaxy that formed 13 billion years ago, I'm going to have to find something that's 13 billion light years away. And that means I'm going to have to see it 
and detect it in the infrared and not the visible. But now we're on a roll. Okay, we know it's far away. We believe it's gonna give us infrared light. We're good, okay. So we have our design well underway. Only one little problem. Okay, here's my galaxy, visible light, good. I know I have to detect it in the infrared. Ooh, I know it's far away, so it's gonna be faint. That means I better have a big collecting mirror because it's not gonna be a lot of light coming. If I wanna see it, I gotta collect it. Okay, third piece of information, it better be big. We already know the thing we're designing is big. Let's take a look. I'm reviewing Mary's information to me. I would like to see this galaxy right there and I'm situated right here. And it's emitting light over the centuries to me and it's getting stretched out, it starts out as visible, ends as infrared. Okay, I agree. One more thing I need to recall, I'm not sure what it is, something about, yeah, warm mice. <laughs> so if I have my dog Ginger sitting on my lap, nice warm Ginger, she's probably radiating in the infrared, right? Just like that mouse. So that's dog, but probably a problem from my telescope, because I don't want light from Ginger getting in the way of the light from my early galaxies. In fact, I actually looked up on Wikipedia what the temperature of the Earth was, and guess what? It's going to come as a shock. It's room temperature. <laughs> and room temperature is about 10 microns, which is right in the zone we want. No good. So I can't, I can't let any light from the Earth get there. The sun is going to be a real pain. Same thing. Moon, need to get all of those out of the picture. Ginger, so long. Great planet. I'm not complaining about the planet. It's just in the way for this problem. All right, so our design means we are going to need to put our telescope somehow in the shade. So the sun is behind the shade. The moon is behind the shade. The Earth is behind the shade. All that stuff is out of the way and it can see the faint light from the distant stars. Okay, so we now have a design. We're working on a really good design here. We know we need a big mirror. We know we need infrared sensitivity, and we know we need to shield it from the light. I'm almost there. I'm gonna need a big light shield, bigger light shield, to cover my mirror, and I'm going to have to arrange some mechanism by which I get the sun, the earth, and the moon to cooperate and stay lined up behind me. All right, a little tricky, that negotiation. So how are we going to do that? Turns out there is a point in space called the second Lagrange point in which that alignment is in fact satisfied. If you go, here's the sun. Here's the Earth and the Moon. If you keep going all the way out here to that point, you have a gravitational sweet spot so that the gravity of those of the Sun and the Moon and the Earth together pulling you in basically balances the centrifugal force of you on the outside. And they all stay aligned and they move together and they revolve together around the Sun. Perfect. No negotiation needed. Now I have a technique. I have a location. I need four elements. Big mirror, infrared sensitivity, I need a big sun shield, and I need to be at L2, a million miles away. <laughs> We're done. We have a design. We've written it down on the back of the envelope. We've used our, our eyes, our pets, Big Bang Theory theme song, right? and just a little bit of scientific knowledge and we're good to go. The rest is the details. $10 billion ish and a few decades, but that's okay. Details. So let's learn a little bit about L2. Well, let's not. Let's see if I can get that. James Webb Space Telescope orbits the sun in sync with Earth, but one million miles further out beyond the moon. 
The telescope's mirror is perpendicular to the 70-foot sun shield, which keeps it cool. There's a warm side. As long as we keep the optic on the cold side and the instruments on the cold side, we're going to be good. I don't see any problems, except it is rather large. I thought 70 feet seems like a bit much to be jamming into a jamming into a rocket. So it turns out, in order to make this work, we have to make it into an origami telescope, fold it up, make the mirror into a bunch of hexagonal segments, and jam it into a very large rocket. Piece of cake. All right. So we pick the Ariane 5, which is provided by the European Space Agency, and it's going to launch from French Guiana on December 18th. Okay, we're good. I now want to show you the video of how it will deploy in space. I want you to watch what, come, what happens. We have the, the uh, solar arrays. Antennas, I think, have deployed. There they are. The structures that hold the sun shield are coming down now. And by the way, what you're seeing here is the path away from the Earth. It's been launched from the Earth. It's passing the moon. It's going on its way to L2. Now the sun shield is starting to unravel and, <laughs> and come under tension. And this is how long it's taken. We're at day five. Wow. Isn't beautiful? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now watch this. Momentum flap, I believe. There's the secondary coming out. It looked like, maybe that's the momentum flap back there. The wings of the primary, yes. Don't remember the boom probably come, boom came up earlier, but it was not the case. Okay, so all these have to and uh, and then we're good to go, right? A little bit of commissioning involved, about six months. Okay, just to remind you, two good features of infrared. Number one gives us the redshift. Okay, so it allows us to look at the early universe, and number two, it looks through obscuring surfaces. This was a visible image on the left and on the right is a thermal image, the infrared image. It goes right through. That's going to help us whenever we look at dusty environments. Here's an example. Visible light, infrared light. Those areas that are in fact obscured, see that? That widow's peak? Dark now and then an infrared luminous. So you see through the dark stuff and then eventually it lights up. Fabulous. All right. So, I just want to talk very briefly, not to go over what was already given by Mary, but here is what did the early universe look like. As we zoom through the Hubble Deep Field looking at ever more distant galaxies, I just want to point out here a Hubble image or simulation of a galaxy in the simulated JWST image. This is the real and the simulated. You'll notice you see more structure here, but what's more interesting is all the little galaxies that you pick up in the background that are not seeable in the Hubble image. That's where we're going. Now, as we look at the early universe as it progresses here, it's going farther and farther. I want you to take a look at the shape of what you're seeing until we get to the very most distant candidates. These all still look like well, blobs and dots, no more spiral structures necessarily, but we're not there yet. Take a look at the little circled areas. Those are the candidates. Wow, those are small and they look like blobs, no grand spiral structures that we see there. So let's keep that in mind. What does the shape reveal? Well, we are going to be looking at galaxies over time. Today, in this area, look at those majestic structures. How do we get from blobs in the beginning to majestic structures today? Well, the early universe was crowded. And maybe those early galaxies interacted. And as we see from these simulations, when galaxies interact, they form really interesting structures. And so possibly that is what we will be seeing as we learn what happens as galaxies evolve over time. All right, 
I don't want to speak to this very much. Um, this is actually a simulation of a star forming region. Uh, molecular clouds are essential in order to make new stars and therefore they are very dusty environments. If we want to see new stars being formed and with them new planets, we are going to have to find a way to look in du into dusty environments such as this. And James Webb will do that with its infrared capability. How do we learn about the atmosphere? How do we know what's in the atmosphere of an exoplanet? The majority of known exoplanets have been discovered because they partially block the light of their host star. This is called a transit. During a transit, some of the star's light travels through the planet's atmosphere and gets absorbed. The light that survives carries information about the planet across light years of space where it reaches our telescopes. However, the planet is very small relative to the star, so it is still very difficult to detect which is why we need a big telescope to be sure to capture this tiny bit of light. So how do we use a telescope to read transit light? Stars emit light at many wavelengths. Like a prism makes a rainbow, we can separate light into its separate wavelengths. This is called a spectrum. Visible light appears to our eyes as the colors of the rainbow, but beyond visible light, there are many wavelengths we cannot see. Now back to the transiting planet. As light is traveling through the planet's atmosphere, some wavelengths get absorbed. Which wavelengths get absorbed depends on which molecules are in the planet's atmosphere. For example, carbon monoxide molecules will capture different wavelengths than water vapor molecules. So when we look at that planet in front of the star, some of the wavelengths of the starlight will be missing, depending on which molecules are in the atmosphere of the planet. Learning about the atmospheres of other worlds is how we identify those that could potentially support life, bringing us another step closer to answering one of humanity's oldest questions. Are we alone? So you see the importance of spectroscopy. Um, I would just like to point out one particular favorite spectrum, and it's this one, the spectrum of our Earth. There are many features there that may be of interest to us as we look at exoplanets. Carbon, carbon dioxide from volcanoes, for example. Methane from cows. Water vapor in the atmosphere. Signs of bi basically biosignatures. Those will be of immense interest. And in order to find them, we need spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a fundamental tool of JWST. And to quote my, my husband's phrase, it puts the fizz in astrophysics. <laughs> so there are many known exoplanets now, many, many, many. And so you can bet James Webb will attempt to look at some of them and see what's there to be seen. All right, but it's tough. An exoplanet is a tiny little thing right next to its parent star, which is bright. How are we going to do this? Well, we use starlight suppression using a chronograph. As you see here, if I'm able to put my thumb in front of, or any obscuring uh, object right in front of the bright star, I have at least a prayer of seeing the planets around it. And that's the theory of coronography. Here, for example, is the size of the Earth relative to the size of the Sun. Pitiful, right there, okay? Trying to see an exoplanet is like trying to find a firefly right next to the city of San Francisco, next to a lighthouse in the city of San Francisco. It's really hard. So here's an example of a star that it does have three exoplanets. Can you see them? A little bit tough, but they're there. And how do I know? Bingo. They come right out. And that is going to be one of the attributes of James Webb. Needless to say, our little back-of-the-envelope calculation of how to design this mission will require a little bit of development. I'm not going to go into details here, but many, many 
technologies needed to be pushed forward in order for this to succeed. And there are the examples of them. And for every piece of technology, it, you must understand that it has its benefits to other sectors of society in some form or another. For example, the JWST ability to focus its optics has applications in medical um, optics, medical optics. Um, mirror testing at 400 minus 450 degrees, right? That's one of my favorites. Turns out that if you take one of the JWST mirrors, push it up, you're good to go, and you're going to measure is it that way you want it. What you do is you bring it down to Marshall Space Flight Center and you test it. And the reason you do is polishing it at room temperature is not guaranteeing it'll be flat at 40 degrees Kelvin. And so when you make it 40 degrees Kelvin, it turns out that it potato chips. Not the right shape, exactly. You make a hit map of it, you bring it back to the facility, polish out the areas that you now remember need to go, you take it back to Marshall Space Flight Center, you test it again, bingo, you're there. That's what you have to learn to do. And there are other areas as well that have advanced. JWST is very complex, very complex instrument. I have uh, uh, drawings here, or images rather, of the four instruments. I'd like to mention in addition that JWST has moving target support. It can observe all of the planetary bodies from Mars on outward. They're moving slowly enough and in the right zone that they can be tracked. It has, as we already know, high contrast imaging through coronography. And we are very interested in the spectroscopy, but spectroscopy can be complicated. I'm mentioning this now because I passed out some gratings and I hope you were playing with them. What if you have a lot of different targets in the field and it's crowded like a subway? How do you get a spectrum of each of those stars? We will see that you do it with a multi-shutter array. They call multiplex spectroscopy, but that's near spec. And there's the array. And if you want spectroscopy of an extended target, which is also complex, we use integral field units. Let's just take a quick look at what those are. In the case of the integral field unit, so complicated to look at an extended object, all of the wavelengths blend with each other from one part to the next. So what you do is you actually partition the image, feed it separately, piece by piece by piece into its own spectrograph, find out what the spectrum is for each of the pieces, and then recombine it after the fact. After the fact, you now have an image, but you have an image for each of the wavelengths in the spectrum. So you're, uh, you now have both the spectral information and the spatial at the same time. The multi-object spectrograph, which is one of my favorites for near spec, as you can see there, is a programmable array of little uh, windows that open and allow you to observe individual targets. The windows are about the size of a few, few hairs, so they're very tiny. They're programmable, and as you see here, they've programmed them to illustrate J JWST. So I sort of doubt there won't be a proposal with that particular shape, but nonetheless. Just a quick few beauty pictures before we go on the technology, because it's, you're going to be kissing it goodbye soon. Here are the mirrors. The lower left, you see the instruments. The next, the instruments are mated to the mirrors on the back plane. In the upper right, this is not too clear. In the upper right is a very large chamber, and they're about to test one of the mirrors in the chamber. That chamber is the largest in NASA, and it was needed for James Webb. It was, as far as I understand it, part of the tourist uh, operation out of Texas, out of um, Johnson Space Flight Center because it was famous for the Apollo era. They had to clean it up and refurbish it in order to use it for James Webb. And there you're seeing the open door, the huge open door as it's being uh, sent in. And finally, you see the uh, membranes of the uh, sun shield with, I believe it's Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, standing in the middle to give you a piece of the size. And of course, the thing that bothers me is that I don't think he's got his hair covered. <laughs> so, testing is completed now. That's where we stand. In this image, it's ready to ship. I want you to see what that looks like. You're buttoning it up.
boat for transport. This container, of course, is air is handled specially, the environment is protected, and so on. But what's funny is the traffic disruption that you're going to see in order to get it to the dock. I think it's more of a big deal than going down the street with the president, maybe. I mean, look at this. All right. The passage took 16 days by boat through the Panama Canal, but it did arrive this last Tuesday. Wow. Yes, 5,800 miles. It's there. We're getting there, folks. So what's going to happen? We launch on December 18th. I'm going to walk you through the commissioning very quickly. And then what happens after that? What do we expect is coming? The first part of commissioning is all the deployments that you saw in that video earlier. We start with the solar array only 31 minutes in, but in the end, the completed deployment isn't finished for 25 days. It takes about 30 days to get to L2, so it's transiting the whole time. And then, the next big step is to take care of the optics, to go through focusing the optics, allowing them to come to a, a thermal stability, because thermal stability will be necessary for the optics to maintain their exquisite focus. And MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument, needs to achieve its operating temperature, and that takes a long time. That's w well into it. Finally, after 118 days, we're ready to bring the instruments into commissioning. This is all called commissioning. And the instruments eventually come online, are calibrated, checked out, and ready to be used. And at the end of six months, we can start to take observations. How does it focus on orbit? Let's take a look. Oops, sorry. there. We're almost ready for science. I just want to point out that my institution, the Space Telescope Science Institute, will be commanding the observatory. The commands will be sent to the Deep Space Network, of which there are three ground stations we use in Canberra, Australia, in Madrid, Spain, and Goldstone, California. Sent up to the observatory, the data will be sent down through the backwards path. And when the data is received, it will be processed through a pipeline process, prepared for science, and distributed to the scientists and archived. This is a picture of the Mission Operations Center, um, where they're actually, I believe, doing a rehearsal in this particular case. I would like to remind you that we also do the science operations, and that, I'm not going to talk to this necessarily, but I do want to point out that it is uh, a little bit more work than just sending commands, in the following sense. If we want to make an observation, you need to know that everyone in the world is welcome to propose to observe. Everyone. If you have an internet connection, you can do it. It's going to have to be a great proposal to win, though, because the first thing that happens is you have a peer review, a science panel of experts, evaluates the proposal and choose and recommends the very best ones. Of these, and it's very competitive and it's really hard to, to, to succeed, once your proposal is selected, <coughs> Your observation will be planned and scheduled. The commands will be sent up to the observatory. The data will come down, will be processed, given to you, placed in the archive, and then things will happen like education and outreach, like maybe the newspaper reporting what you've discovered, and maybe having meetings like this at some point. And so that's science operations. 
We have actually had our first peer review, very first one, to, to recommend and select the first set of science observations, and I'm pleased to report what we're going to be seeing. All right, this was very competitive. More than 10,000 hours were granted for the first cycle of observing. Of these, about 6,000 are given to the general observer, which is the type of observer we would be if we proposed that way. There were 400 programs selected out of 11,000 submitted. There were more than 2,500 investigators, we call them investigators, proposers worldwide. So the uh, principal investigator and their collaborators that propose with them. Normally, you would issue a new call for proposals every year. So what we're looking at next is going to be the science we expect to see, some of the science we expect to see coming out after commissioning ends and the observations begin. So just a few teasers for what's ahead. For example, many nearby galaxies, there we will be uh, observing 40 local galaxies such as these, which are spectacular, and we will also obtain photometry of 1,500 cepheids to help with the distance ladder scale in the universe. The second one, I love. This is an image of the galactic center. Very dusty, right? Very dense. Really hard to see in there. But not so hard with infrared, luckily. Notice all the interesting structures. What you may not realize, however, is that the center of our galaxy, the point where it rotates around, is a supermassive black hole. Yes, we do have a black hole in the galaxy. And last year, a Nobel Prize was awarded to two investigators, one of whom Irene and I know, Andrea Goetz, and Reinhard De uh, Genzel, I believe his name is, uh, in 2020 for, the, for establishing that black hole. And the solar system, so much good stuff. Now, this is kind of local for me personally. I don't know much about the solar system, but some people in here do, I understand. But notice, all the planets there that we are looking at and the moons that will be investigated, comets. Let's take a look at some, for example, asteroids. But let's look at Jupiter and Saturn, for example, in the next slide. Jupiter and Saturn, there will be particular investigations. They will look at the red spot of Jupiter. They will check for small moons, look at Saturn's rings. They will search for activity on suspected subsurface oceans of Europa and Enceladus. Why do we suspect they're there? Because geysers of plumes of water have been detected. Pretty good, right? Volcanoes on Io, very active volcanic region. And Titan has actual methane clouds. So they'll be very interesting to see. I believe it's methane, very interesting to see uh, the atmosphere of Titan as well. So these are pretty exciting science. I do think the scientific promise of James Webb looks good, but remember, part of the job for, for this mission is to become the people's telescope just like Webb was, just like, excuse me, Hubble was. What you see here on the left is a guitar skin. In the middle you see a human skin with a tattoo on it, and you see some dancing tights on the right. And these are all Hubble images. What about James Webb? Well, we already see artwork for James Webb. We already see jewelry for James Webb. We see uh, beautiful artwork there. We see a pumpkin already getting ready for, for Halloween. And I would just like to point out that as a Christmas gift, I got a scarf with the Veil Nebula on it. I hope I someday get a James Webb scarf. <laughs> All right, so the last question then is, let's bring it back to the Big Bang Theory that helped us go ahead and design this observatory. Will it make it? Will this be a beloved telescope? I would like to point just one little thing out to you in the upper corner, the little James Webb model. So it's looking like we might make it. And that's it. I'd like to thank you all, especially Irene Poro, for inviting me here. And these are many contributors that helped with my talk.
Thank you, Kathy. That was phenomenal. And I actually going for the dancing tights. I don't know whether <laughs> everybody else is choosing, but I'll go for both. I want to open the floor for questions. Uh, I already see a hand there. Just a second, though, because I also want to remind our friends who are watching via live stream to post their questions that maybe they're already coming in the chat uh, of the live stream and what your questions will be relayed to the speaker uh, in real time or as close as possible. All right, so actually, here we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. This yeah. means so much to me that, first of all, that I'm going to hopefully be alive for the launching. I've been waiting for it for years uh, in, your, in your presentations outstanding. And uh, what my question is, is I, I knew the original launch date was a couple years prior. If you could maybe just tell me one or two challenges that interfered with the original launch date. Thank you. Yes, the original launch date, when I first went to Space Telescope, they were predicting 2013. So we were off by quite a bit, and it, it really worried me because um, <laughs> I wanted to live to launch too. Um, and part of the problem originally on is the difficulty, I think was embedded in the DNA a bit of the budget. It's really critically important to have the right budget and the right budget profile in order to progress properly. I discovered the hard way in my own work that if I have to defer work because I don't have the right money at that time, it actually becomes more expensive to do it later. So I think that was a bit of a problem in the early days. There are some complex reasons for it. But to their credit, I, get, I thank Congress for having decided to step up and support this mission. And they have been very strong and very supportive, um, very much so. Both sides of the aisle, both the House and the Senate, very strong supporters of the mission. And they uh, allocated the budget to us, which um, you know, to NASA to carry out this mission. So in the end of the day, uh, I think those were the original challenges, but the truth is, as you can imagine, all the way through there are technology challenges. Technology challenges are immensely difficult, maybe a little more difficult than our back of the envelope calculation here. Um, and, but those, were, those are surmounted by very smart people putting their heads against the problem and solving them and trying and sometimes failing and picking up and trying again. There's a lot of failure involved in achieving a great and one-off you know, thing, an extraordinary thing. We'll have a lot of challenges all the way through. So I think those are some of the reasons why it took much longer than is anticipated. So what was the overall cost to make this happen? So I, th I have not checked the details, but uh, the original allocated, you know, after it was rebaselined, was I think $8 billion for development. I don't actually know if the, la the most, recent uh, most recent months or last year or two have made any difference there. I, I just am not informed on that. I could probably find out though. But that, does, that only talks about the, Euro the American or the US contribution. Remember, there was a significant contribution from the European Space Agency and from the Canadian Space Agency that isn't counted there. So why is it French Guyana and are we going to be able to launch it live? The launch? I think yes, <laughs> but I don't know for sure. And French Guyana, partly because it's a European, uh, the European Space Agency facility for Ariane and its location at the equator is advantageous. That, that would be my... That would be my guess, but I'm not expert on that. Hi, thank you for your time. No, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, with the new infrared light that we're going to be getting back, be able to do anything different to the cosmic microwave background image that they have now that looks back at the beginning of the universe? Is that uh, anywhere on par with something that the web will be able to do is going to alter the way that those small temperature changes are viewed? Or? I don't think it will, um, partly because the physics of what James Webb is going for actually starts to happen after that domain 
a little it's bit after that. After the yeah the insertion yeah. period. Yeah. Stuff. Gotcha. Okay. So that's all I was asking. That's yeah. Very curious. Thank you. So basically, basically, where we're going is right after the Big Bang, and you're you know. Three hundred thirty thousand years yeah. after that. Though. I I'm like, yeah. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Sorry. But I could be wrong. I'm not expert in this. Other questions? I'm a little tougher than I may have wanted to be. <laughs> I made up the answer, and you just have to no, tell me which part right. you didn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any? Yes. So um, you spoke about the advantages of the different wavelengths that I can see. Does it do more magnification, though, than the Hubble did? Magnification? Like, could you see, would an object appear larger than it did if you look at it with the Hubble? No, I don't or, or think, working. that's not the way I would describe it. I think what, what, we, what we might want to ask, if, if I'm interpreting it correctly, is can we see it more clearly, sure. the same object? And what's interesting about this, and very few people realize this, is that, so Hubble uh, subtends a certain segment of the spectrum and James Webb is a little bit different, so they're not the same, but in the area where they overlap, it's comparable or even better than Hubble. So spectacular is a good word to apply to what, what we will be able to do. I think John was going to ask a question. <laughs> It's a little hard to see with the lights, so we can't always see the, the hands. Um, thank you. Very wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, how long can we hope to have the telescope operate oh, once it's great, deployed? Great question. When, when I was first mission head, the um, planned lifetime was 10 years, and we were hoping to nudge 12 out of it. Depends a little bit on how much fuel and stuff you have, and the reason for that is when you go to L2, L2, you have to do what, what's called station keeping. It wants to wander away, and you have to sort of, it's not that perfectly stable. So it, it needs a little bit of uh, fine tuning now and then. And with some tricks, you can sort of stretch your, bu your budget a little bit. For example, the um, Space Telescope Science Institute would be looking at managing the momentum really well, right? And using other tricks to stretch it. So I suspect, I think it depends a lot on how much fuel is needed during um, the ascent to the final orbit to determine exactly, that's my guess, how long the, the, light, the actual usable life will be. But um, I don't know the exact number. Right. I'm very interested in uh, aligning baking mirrors. I mentioned it earlier, but that for me is it's what makes me nervous about the whole mission. So can you tell us again, maybe a little bit more, you know, what is involved, but also how much science can we still do if some of them don't align? So each mirror has a set of actuators and multiple degrees of freedom. You're able to move it and you're able to tilt it a bit, and you're actually able to change the curvature slightly. Okay, that's a lot of capability, mm -hmm. but is, that's a lot of capability is, that appears to be needed. So you're a little concerned if it takes that many actuators on each one, and you have so many, what if you lose one? What if you lose two? Does it mess up the whole thing? So. An undergraduate woman came to Space Telescope and asked for a project, and we gave her that project. Mm -hmm. Can you look at this and tell us how many we can afford to lose before we're in trouble? And the answer was five. Yeah. It's got to, it can't be a unique five. It can't be maybe, you know, the secondary mirror, mm -hmm. right? But yes, you can lose five, it turns out. So it's, there is some redundancy, if you like, in the capabilities which is a little bit uh, relieving. I, yes. I do understand the anxiety. <laughs> a lot of anxious people will be there for, it will be six months of an interesting yeah. period of time. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you have one? Uh, so just in my hat, but I could, I could spend a long time talking to you, so I won't keep you too long. Anybody online that has a question?
Oh, uh, what if it breaks or something in space? Is there like a plan on how it can be repaired? <sighs> yeah, no. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, that's a really great idea because you, I mean, with NASA's capabilities these days, you can think about uh, larger and larger telescopes. You could think about putting telescopes together, adding in yet another, you know, batch to this mirror or that mirror. You can imagine a lot of things, but the experience so far, with human beings at least, is that these are observatories in low Earth orbit. The trick of actually, I, I personally do not see any astronaut going out to L2. No. I could imagine, with another mission, a robot going out to L2, or something going out to L2 and bringing it back for repair, maybe, I don't know. But I think it, for James Webb, I don't think that's a starter. That's my personal opinion. I don't think for Webb it is, but you better believe that NASA will be thinking about these are large, ambitious missions and just you know, groundbreaking. Um, Though I'm sure that they will, they will think about about that carefully for any of these uh, future endeavors. I have some questions from our live stream viewers. So a question from Pat is: When is the soonest we should expect to see the first spectacular photos? Fantastic question, wonderful question, and I can tell you the answer <laughs> because <laughs> so we're about two months away from launch. Commissioning is six months, okay? That's eight months from now. After that period of time, after commissioning is over, the instruments are ready to start taking images. And I'm sure NASA will choose the day and unveil some of the images and science from James Webb. Those are called early release observations. I don't know what they will be, but I expect them to be six months, just about after commissioning, maybe a couple weeks to, to get them in perfect order and could well be that in a year from now, I'm not just telling you what we hope to see, I may be actually telling you what we saw and what we discovered. Great question. That's great. I have another question from Peg. Given the fact that Webb had to be assembled in a clean room, how will the transfer into the nose cone be managed? Good question. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I don't personally know the exact details, but generally speaking, you use a clean tent whenever you make transfers, which means a, a clean room environment, a portable clean room environment in, that, that is placed over. In the case of Webb, it's so large, I actually don't know the details. It could be that they will, they will, it will be moved into a, a large environment that is itself clean and then transferred. I'm sorry, but I just don't know. I could find out if you like, though. Anything else? Hey, one more question. Yeah. What's on? What's next for you? What, uh, ah. What's next for you? Do you have any plans after this mission? Me? Yeah, you personally, yeah. Oh wow! Does your, does your mind think about the future, like the next big thing? I always think about like little gas stations out in space. We got to place yes. things so that we can actually put yes. them farther. We need places to go to get to L two. Yes. Needs checkpoints, I should say. Okay. Where, where do you think about? That? I really appreciate and the question. You get my uh, sentiment. Thanks. So first, I have one. Thing that I would like to mention, there is a mission launch that I'll be attending. Uh, it's planned. You have to get through all the review processes, but it would be December 9th, and it's called XP. It's a polarization mission for X-rays, and I'm really, really thrilled to actually see that launched. It's uh, polarization in, in X-rays has been a, you know, a holy grail in some sense for decades. So that will be great, and it's an explorer, so it's relatively small for big missions. We all are sitting with fingers crossed, bated breath, whatever you want, for the Decadal Survey. The Decadal Survey is a, a, a process that happens every 10 years in astronomy and astrophysics where they gather together, hundreds of astronomers together into panels to explore the state of, the, of astronomy as it is today and to recommend the highest priorities for the next decade. And out of that will undoubtedly come a set of recommendations, including a large mission and probably moderate missions and science questions that need to be explored or they recommend to be explored. 
And I can guarantee, based on just the things that, you know, that I have read and the things that have been proposed, that it'll be really stunning science ahead of us. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, I don't know which one it's going to be yet, right, because they haven't released it. But keep your fingers crossed, it's, it's due. <laughs> it was due like weeks ago, so <laughs> it could be soon. <laughs> I actually have a question. Sure. Um, so you said that James Webb will have a lifespan of 10 to 12 years. What will happen to the telescope after those 10 to 12 years? Oh boy, I hate to think about that. Um, I, it's a good question. I don't actually know. I mean, eventually, of course, the cold makes a difference. You, you don't keep things at temperature or anything else. But I, I really can't tell you very much. I haven't thought it through. Forgive me. It's yes, most likely going to stay there or be in. Yes, I mean, because not not returned, right? Right. Yeah. And L two, you got to worry about whether it's going to start. It's a gravitational sweet spot. You got to worry a little about whether it's going to start to collect stuff. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's kind of a preferred piece of real estate for astrophysics. We have another question from Pat. How will Webb be protected from micro meteorites Very good other question. similar space objects? Okay, that's a very good question. And one of the things that you may have noticed about the sun shield is that they had actually five layers of sun shield and not one. Why would you need five layers of sun shield, right? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why is because if you got a meteorite punching a hole in one sun shield, you would have a direct beam path of light to that mirror. It would be a disaster. Right? All of a sudden, you'd have a spotlight shining on this mirror that's intended to detect very faint light from the distant galaxy. And so what they do is they put five of them, and they're all angled at different angles. Okay, And so it, it helps to reduce the probability of that being a problem for the contamination. Um, in other observatories, uh, in low Earth orbit, for example, I do know f sometimes the observatory is actually oriented so the safe side faces meteoroid showers. And so things like that are something that are routinely thought of as issues. So these are good questions, but I do want to mention that's a great question that pertains to the sun shield directly.